thing. Glory be to God. The Bible teaches that God has a timetable for everything. In every man's life, in every woman's life, there comes a day when things will no longer be the same. For someone here tonight, this is the day. The Bible says, from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffered violence. And the violence have taken it by force. Our topic tonight says, all wars must come down. It didn't say all wars may come down. He said all wars must come down. If all wars must come down, there's an element of violence involved in must. When the wall of Jericho fell, it was not a gentle shout. It was a shout that shook the foundation of the wall. Several years ago, hallelujah, during one Holy Ghost service, we prayed some violent prayers, and someone contacted me after the service and said, sir, You're supposed to be a gentleman. Christianity teaches that you must be as gentle as a dove. I said, yes, sir. I agree. By that time, we just moved to the camp. And we were living among pythons and snakes. Once upon a time, we would come in and find a snake under the bed sheet. On one occasion, I went into the bedroom of the boys. It was a double-decker bed. Thank God I went in. They haven't come in then. And I saw a snake climbing the double-decker bed. I didn't say, ah, 
Thou beautiful creature of God. I understand. It is cold outside. That's why you have come into the room. I wasn't gentle as a dove. I did what was necessary to be done. Today you are not going to be gentle as a dove. Everything you do tonight must be done with violence. So I want you to begin by praising God violently. I want you to praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him violently. Praise Him with all your strength. Praise Him. Praise Him. Jesus, mighty name, we have worshipped. I'm serving the God of miracles. I know. Yes, I know. I am serving the God of miracles. I know. Yes, I know. Hallelujah. I am serving the God of miracles. I know. Yes, I know. I am serving the God of miracles. I know. Yes, I know. What about? He says I should tell someone all those who are trying to terminate your destiny one by one before the new year they will perish
What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Heaven and earth adore. Angels bow before you. What a mighty God. King of kings, Lord of lords, the ancient of days, the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who is called the Lord of hosts, the King of glory, strong, mighty, mighty in battle. Glory be to your holy name. Tonight, in the lives of every one of your children, please prove yourself. Fight our battles for us. Give us absolute victory. And let your name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Uh, let somebody shout a violent hallelujah. Shake hands with one or two people and tell him, oh, tonight is for me. And then you may please be seated, except those born in the month of November. My Father, my God, I want to bless your name for your children born in the month of November. I'm praying for each and every one of them that we will give them 11th hour miracles. That your grace upon them will not just be double, but double plus. That they will have a new beginning of joy, of victory, of progress, of anointing, and of mighty testimonies. And I pray that they will serve you like never before. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. At long last, Congress is here.
And as you know, the theme for this year's Congress is Divine Repositioning. The Bible says in His Word that the last shall be first. It takes God to take you from the last and put you in front. The Bible tells us that the weak should say, I am strong. It takes divine intervention for the weak to become suddenly strong. The Bible says, let the poor say, I am rich. You have, you have had testimonies of people who are not even hoping to be able to rent a flat who became a landlord within days. That's divine repositioning. The Almighty God wants to do something this year that the world will hear about it and they will tremble. I will advise you, whatever is going to cost you, every day of the Congress, make sure you attend. The reason God is clearing walls this month is so that there will be nothing between you and your miracles in December. Of course, I'm sure you know the dates. If you don't know the dates, you can see me wearing it. Uh, the Holy Ghost Congress. It's coming from December 4 to 10. It's going to be extraordinary. I'm going to be very brief tonight because fortunately for me, the man who spoke before me had done an excellent job. <laughs> Everything he learned from me, he re repeated. As a very good son, if you can repeat what your daddy says, he shouldn't have been saying, Daddy told us. He should have just gone ahead and say it as if he's the one saying it for the first time. <laughs> it was very beautiful, very beautiful presentation. Praise God. A wall is a boundary. The elders will tell you, even when the farm belongs to both father and son, there will still be a boundary. A wall, as you will probably see in big houses, uh, is telling your neighbor, you may be richer than I, you may be stronger than I, but this wall is saying, this is your boundary. It's how far you can go and no further. Not all walls are bad. When, when you see, if you go to a Koyi or VI, you see some mighty houses. You see big walls around them. And he's simply saying to all those who are outside the wall, <laughs> there are treasures here. 
You don't see such houses in Ajegunle. You don't see us building mighty walls around our houses in Moshi. And when you go to places where <laughs> within the walls there are treasures, the walls are high. But the walls around us, uh, uh, maybe I should give you a Bible passage for that to let you know not all walls are evil. Revelation chapter 21 from verse 10 to 12. Revelation 21 from verse 10 to 12. Talks about uh, the holy Jerusalem, the great city of God, surrounded by walls because within that city <laughs> all manners of precious things are but it's simply saying the walls that are great and high etc etc is telling outsiders you can see the wall but you can call me. So walls basically means that which tells you thus far you can come and no further. And so you, you, you find that walls are in categories um, I won't have enough time to go through all the categories but I will try to mention some of them to you there are some walls that are natural they were, they have been, they were there some walls like uh, say the Red Sea the Red Sea have been there for donkey years since, since the world was formed. It only became a war when the children of Israel were on their way to the promised land and it stood in their way. And I can give you an illustration of, of that straight away. Uh, when you are born and you are born black, there's nothing wrong with being born black, depending on where you are born, depending on which nation. <laughs> there are some nations in the world that if you're a black man, there's a limit to how far you can go. You want to move beyond a certain level, they tell you. <laughs> it's like I was telling some of my uh, children. You may carry a British passport. Hmm? But a day will come when you want to do something and they will let you know there is no British that is actually black. Yeah. One day I was about to enter into London and there was this uh, immigration officer and he was giving me all manners of problems. When finally I was allowed to go, I looked at him, I said, sir, I already got my passport stamped. <laughs> I said, why is it that it is those of us who are from other nations that become a problem? He looked at me, I said, I am British. 
But just by looking at him, I know he was an Indian. I said, you? He said, yes. I said, you are an Indian. <laughs> I said, one day they would show you that no true British will look like you. As, as soon as I said that, I ran. <laughs> so you are born black, that can become a war. Just like the Red Sea, which was sitting down quietly on his own until the children of Israel wanted to pass through. We'll talk a little more about Red Sea in a moment. And then there are wars that you inherited. The wars have been there before you were born. I'm sure you have heard of things they call generational causes. You were not there when your father or great grandfather misbehaved. But then there is a war created by a curse pronounced on the family that will be there blocking your way. I remember very well before I became a Christian in my family line uh, I think I can hear some people clapping far away. You better relocate because it's not a, a night when you shouldn't hear. I came from a family that if a woman gives birth to a boy, she must not eat salt or oil for nine days. Seven days if it, if it happened to be a girl. And if she dares eat, the child will die. And this is traceable to the days of uh, warfare. Because our great grandfather was a mighty warrior. And he did something to one of the slaves, and that one placed a curse on the family. He took Jesus to break that curse. That Jesus that broke the curse in my family we break every curse in your family. <laughs> and then there are walls that are man-made, like Jericho wall. Oh, by the way, we'll be talking about Jericho wall in a moment. In fact, our text is from Joshua chapter 6, verse 20. Joshua 6, verse 20. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpet, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. So there are walls that are natural, walls that are inherited, walls that are man-made. And then, probably the most critical of all of them will be the walls you build yourself. was that you erected yourself that is blocking your way but in the, the name of the one who made heaven and earth in the name of the one 
who allowed you to be alive till today, every wall must come down today. I'm going to be brief like I promised you, but uh, let's take the Red Sea as an illustration. Like I said, the Red Sea only became a wall when it blocked the way of Israel to the Promised Land. And uh, the Red Sea is symbolic of delays. The children of Israel were already going. They've left Pharaoh and his host far behind. But when they got to the Red Sea, they were stuck. And they were stuck there until the enemy caught up with them. Red Sea represents wars that allow people that you have left behind to catch up with you, particularly enemies. Red Sea represents the kind of wars that can send you back to square one because the plan of Pharaoh and his host was hey, to recapture the children of Israel and take them back into slavery. The Red Sea represents situations that can cause you to backslide, to go back to where you have already said bye-bye. The Red Sea represents walls that can render your previous victories useless. Children of Israel had already left Egypt singing victory songs because at long last they were delivered They left with a lot of wealth. They were healthy. But the Red Sea wanted them to go back so that all the previous victories can become useless. The Red Sea represents the kind of wall that not only delays you for enemies to catch up with you, it could ultimately lead to death. I give you just one example. Samson. The problem of Samson was that uh, he was a Jew living among enemies of the Jews. He was born to be a mighty conqueror. But there was a wall. And that wall was that he was always uh, looking in the wrong direction. And when the enemy finally caught up with him, the fact that he alone, single-handedly, had killed a thousand of them was no longer of any consequence. He captured the champion plucked out his eyes, bound him, sent him to prison to, to begin to dance before the idols. And finally, he died. I pray today, in the name of the one who sent me, 
Every red sea in your way shall part. I will talk briefly about the Jericho Wall as another example of what a wall could be. The Jericho Wall is symbolic of a situation in your life that defies the promises of God. God had made certain promises to you. You had come maybe to the Holy Ghost service and the word of God had come direct. And you know that you know that you know that this word is for me. No doubt about it. And yet, years had passed. You've had other people who were present during that time giving testimonies showing that the man of God didn't lie. And so you begin to wonder, uh, I know he didn't lie. I'm sure that when the prophesied he was, he was talking to me, how come my own case had not come to pass? You see, because God had already told Joshua Every place your foot shall tread upon, I'm giving it to you. And then here comes the wall of Jericho. And the wall of Jericho seemed to be saying, Where is that your God? The wall of Jericho represents something that is saying, You are so near and yet you are so far. Because that wall, that wall is the only barrier now before the children of Israel can really move on into all the promises of God. The wall of Jericho seem, represents when you are doing everything God says you should do. You pray, you fast. You pay your tithes, you give your offerings, you win souls, you even build churches, and yet God seems to be silent. As the wall of Jericho. Everything in your life that is causing people to say, where is your God? That wall will fall tonight. <laughs> and then I will take another, just one more example. Among these uh, external walls, before we now come and spend just a bit more time on the walls you build for yourself. Let's take Goliath. You know, whether you believe it or not, the enemy can see a little bit into your future. As the elders, they will tell you that uh, the original Babalaos, the Ifaoriku specialists, the genuine ones, not, <laughs> not the ones that are divinating through internet. <laughs> the elders will tell you that the Babala can see at least four days ahead 
they, they, they have a proverb. They said, as today is, that's not how tomorrow will be. That's why the Babala will check the oracle every five, five days. You can see five days ahead and then you can go further. Many a times from the moment you were born, the devil had a glimpse of what you are going to become. I don't know where the devil was when God anointed David in the house of Jesse. But somehow, the devil knew this little boy is going to become a king. So he decided that before this boy can become a king, I will kill him. He tried the lion. The lion failed. He tried a bear. The bear failed. You know what? Only God knows how many efforts the devil has made to destroy you. You, may, you don't know how many battles God has fought for you up to this moment. You don't know. <laughs> I don't have time to tell stories, but if I, would, if I were to tell you how many efforts the devil made over my life when I was small, You'll be amazed. It's a miracle that we are still alive today, brother. It's a miracle that we are still alive today, sister. Let me hear you shout hallelujah to God. So the lion failed, the bear failed, and the devil said, well, uh, let's do it this way. Let me present my champion. And listen to what Goliath was saying. You can read it in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm sure you know the story. That's why I'm not wasting time. What Goliath said is, send one man to fight me. If I defeat him, you all become our slaves. If he defeats me, we become your slaves. All the devil was after was the kingdom that God has prepared for David. The devil had arranged it that this boy, uh, I will tell his father to send him to the war front. I know when he gets there, he will begin to brag about his God. And then we'll kill him and take over the kingdom. But uh, there's someone who is called the Alpha and the Omega. Not only does he know the end from the beginning, he is your beginning. And it's going to be your ending. Mm. Today, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, every Goliath, Goliath in your life will fall. But the, the one I'm concerned about is not the Red Sea. The Red Sea is going to part tonight. The one I'm concerned about is not Jericho. Not Jericho War. Jericho War will fall tonight. Must fall tonight. 
I'm not even concerned about Goliath. Because the one who has brought you thus far, the one who gave you victory over the lion, victory over the bear, he will take care of Goliath also. Thank you, Father. Lord asked me to tell somebody, the bleeding has stopped. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Ah, thank you, Father. Some of you probably had me tell the story before. We were in the very first auditorium and Miracles were happening around the altar. And uh, there was a short man in the crowd. He wanted to see what was going on around the altar. And when he turns to the right, somebody taller will block his eyes. He turns to the left, another fellow will block his face. And he cried to God, Oh God, I wish I were taller. And God heard in heaven and spoke to me and said, Hey, there's somebody there saying, I wish I were taller. The Lord said, Tell him, I've already granted his request. He should check his trouser. The man looked at his trouser, <laughs> and the trouser seemed to be shorter. God said, It's not the trouser that has become shorter. It is you who have become taller. Why am I telling this story? The Lord asked me to tell you the same miracle is happening here tonight. There are certain walls that you create for yourself. Walls that you carry everywhere. And number one of them is laziness. The word of God made it clear a lazy man, a slothful man, we always be under tribute the word of God says in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 29 Proverbs 22 verse 29 he says see us how a man diligent in his business that's the fellow who is going to stand before kings you read second king chapter 13 I read it from verse 14 onwards. Second Kings 13 from verse 14 onwards. Elisha was about to die. A king came to him and said, ah, You are the one who has been defending my nation. What am I going to do now? Elisha said, No problem. I can settle the situation for your country before you die. Hey, get an arrow, open the window, shoot. He shot. And Elijah said, That's victory for you. And Elijah said, Okay, take that arrow now, smite the ground. And he smote three times and stopped. The man of God said, Ah, why? You should have continued at least five times or more. And your victory would have been total. He said, but now, we only have three victories. Laziness. And you know, I've, I've told some of you in the past, what embarrassed me most is that uh, Elisha who said that was here alive. 
If I were the king, I would say, eh, hey, three times is not enough. Eh, hey, you say five times or so, eh, I will grab the, the arrow and I will keep smiting the ground. Not five times, not ten times. I, I, I will keep smiting until he begs me to stop. But the king was lazy. You know, one of the biggest was that many of us are is that we can't even pray for one hour. Remember when Jesus took Peter and Paul to the Garden of Gethsemane and said, watch for me. Watch with me for one hour. I mean, watch with me. I'm going to pray. He came back and said, ah, you can't even watch for one hour. You know, anytime we finish, I finish preaching, and I say, you can come to the altar, come and pray. When I say that, I usually go to lay hands on some very special cases. By the time I return, I see that some people are already wondering, where did he go? They think 15 minutes prayer is already too long. That wall must fall tonight. <laughs> in, the, in the old days, when we finished preaching in the redeemed presence of God, nobody stops you, they just say, go and pray. On Sunday morning, I finish preaching, they, uh, they say, go and pray. We will come back for evening service and some people are still on their knees praying. Now some of you here who had never prayed for one hour. That's going to change. The way you said amen showed me that... Uh, <laughs> Laziness is a terrible war. I mean, I remember years ago in one of the universities, I went to them and they, they said to me, ah, Pastor, because they are not all members of my church, and everybody was either a pastor or a bro in those days. Pastor, I thought you said that the Holy Spirit would teach us all things. How come that we, we all failed in our examinations? I asked them, how much time do you spend in studying? Because they say they are in fellowship. And they will be singing and dancing and even though examination is on. And, but the Holy Spirit was supposed to teach us all things. I said, he said he would teach you those things that you have been taught. He would remind you rather of those things that you have learned. You don't study and you fail. The Holy Spirit will comfort you. He will tell you don't worry, you are not dead yet. Try again. It's only that your classmates now have become your senior. I want somebody to lift his hand high to God and say, I will never be lazy again. <laughs> you say it as if you mean it. <laughs> Laziness. It's a terrible war. Another war is pride. Thank you, Father. 
The Lord asked me to tell someone. He said, the chain that the enemy tied around your waist, that he uses in pulling you back anytime you want to move forward, the chain is broken. Pride is a terrible wall. Why? Ah, the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 6, James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, God resists the proud. How can you move forward when God is the one pushing you backwards? How can you? <laughs> I've said it before. If a demon is blocking your way and you say, I command you, get out of my way. And the demon says, in whose name are you saying the name of Jesus? And he will get out of the way. But if an angel is the one blocking your way and you say, I command you, get out of my way, he says, in whose name? You say, in the name of Jesus, he said, he's the one who asked me to stand here. God receives the proud. In fact, Psalm 73, verse 6, Psalm 73, verse 6 says, A proud man is like a man in chains. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, Proverbs 16, verse 18 says, Destruction follows pride. When pride comes, then destruction follows. Proverbs 29, verse 23. Proverbs 29, verse 23 says, Pride brings a man low. In 2 Kings chapter 5, from verse 1 to 14, 2 Kings chapter 5, from verse 1 to 14, but for the grace of God, Naaman would have lost his healing. He would have died a leper. Because when he came and the man of God said, go to Jordan and wash and be clean, he said, me? General Neyman, and there are better rivers where I'm coming from. Can't I go there and wash and be clean? A leper dictating how he should be healed. Thank God for extended mercy. May God extend his mercy to you tonight. A lot of people, when they are talking, Daddy Gio, thank God for your humility. Thank God for your humility. I learned my lesson the hard way. You don't know who is sitting before you. Yeah. <laughs> I was poor and proud. In every area, just proud. And then and there's nothing to show for the pride. Became born again. When I became born again, I was the most educated man in the church. So I became the interpreter for Papa, the general superintendent. And every other pastor left me to interpret for him. When other pastors wanted an interpreter, they took somebody else. There were quite a few interpreters anyway. Then one day, one pastor just came to me and said, brother, you'll be interpreting for me today. Huh? Me? I didn't say it loud though. <laughs> 
What does he, who does he think he is? Asking me. <laughs> the special interpreter for the Baba. This pastor. I interpreted for him because in the redeemed Christian Church of God, <laughs> a worker can't say no to a pastor. Well, you've heard the story before. Because one of the gifts God gave me early in my Christian life was the ability to hear from him. We finished the sermon. The man didn't know how my, my heart was boiling. If he had known, he would have asked me to go and sit down and he would have taken another interpreter. And as I was going to my car, and in those days, in the entire redeemed Christian Church of God, there were five cars. And my own was one of the newest, and it was second hand. As I was going to my car, God spoke and said, ah, So you are now too big to interpret for my servant. And suddenly, heaven was shut. I didn't hear a word from God anymore. And the devil knew that I wasn't hearing. So he tormented me as much as he could. Ah. I pray that God will not resist you. I wept. I prayed. I, read, I fasted. I did it. And God didn't talk. Everyone was silent. God will not be silent to you. It got so bad that I, one day I prayed. I said, God, forgive me this once. And if I'm going to offend you again tomorrow, please kill me today. Then he knew he got me. And he started speaking again. By the grace of God, he has been speaking ever since. Pride nearly destroyed me. And the wall fell. The wall of pride fell in my life, fell so thoroughly that years later, when I became general overseer, I went to Elisha and I, I went into our church there and there was a deacon that was about to lead the Bible study that night they didn't know I was coming I just came in and they took me to the altar I sat down there and he was already at the altar to teach as soon as he saw me he said ah thank God you have come and I said no I'm not here to teach he said, ah, you must talk to us. I said, okay, you preach, I will interpret. <laughs> General Vasya interpreting for the deacon. His leg was shaking. I told him, don't worry, preach, I will interpret. After some time, of course, he forgot who was the interpreter. When the Holy Spirit grabbed him. The, the, the fellow who wasn't a pastor, I was a worker. The worker who wasn't willing to interpret for a pastor became a general overseer who interpreted for a deacon because the world fell. In the name that's above every other name, the wall of pride in your life will fall tonight. Another wall that must fall in your life tonight is called anger. Anger. 
Psalm 37 from verse 8 to 9. Psalm 37 from verse 8 to 9 say, Cease from anger. Stay away from the camp of evildoers so that you are not cut off. Some of you enjoy being angry. You have a violent temper. You are quickly annoyed. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 17. Proverbs 14 verse 17 says, The one who is soon angry deals foolishly. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9 says, Anger rests in the bosom of fools. Ah, thank you, my father. I think you better listen very carefully to this. So. God wants me to tell someone, he said, you must never forget that he can reverse the irreversible. So he wants me to tell you that very soon, your tight is going to be bigger than your 100% now. He asked me to tell you when that time comes, don't begin to play tricks because he can reverse the irreversible. Write that down. You have very little now. It's about to multiply you. It's about to make your tithe bigger than your hundred percent. So when that time comes, don't forget that you can reverse the irreversible. We're talking about anger. Even God, the Almighty, the Bible says, is slow to anger. The Almighty God Himself is slow to anger. So if you are quick to anger, something is wrong with you because the bible says in proverbs chapter 16 verse 32 proverbs 16 verse 32 he said the one who is slow to anger is better than the mighty mm. psalm 145 verse 8 psalm 145 verse 8 says even the lord the maker of heaven and earth the one who can do as he pleases, he is slow to anger. The Bible wants you, in Proverbs chapter 22, from verse 24 to 25, Proverbs 22, hmm, 24 to 25, the Lord says that I should tell a woman, He said, your husband is definitely a failure. And that your sons are beginning to show signs that they want to follow in his footsteps. But the Lord asked me to tell you, I will intervene. Consider Moses, we're talking about anger. Numbers chapter 20 from verse 1 to 12. Numbers 20 from verse 1 to 12. It was anger that did not allow Moses to make it to the promised land. It was anger that was his wall. Get rid of 
anger. Nobody gets angry without a reason. But the moment you feel anger welling up in you, tell yourself immediately, don't be a fool. Because it doesn't matter who had wronged you. Huh? Anger is called temporary madness. Maybe temporary, but it's madness. And during the period of that madness, you can do something that you will never be able to reverse. That word called anger must fall tonight. Yes. All right, let me take maybe about one or two others. Uh, there's something called unbelief. You know, Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Mark 9 verse 23 says if you can only believe all things are possible to him that believes let me assure you my God can do anything he's the God of all flesh there's nothing too hard for him to do. The wall that has been standing between many of us and our miracles is something called unbelief. There are promises of God that when you hear them, they sound impossible. But if it is God speaking, hey, believe him. He's the maker of heaven and earth. When I was praying for a house, a motion, and he promised me I will build you a city, I believed him. It didn't make sense. If I say to you tonight that my God is saying that very soon you will be among the greatest, will you believe him? <laughs> if I tell you tonight that your Red Sea is going to part, will you believe him? There have been occasions he had tested us to find out, do we believe? I was telling some of my children, somewhere I can't remember whether in Europe or something, of one occasion when the Almighty God told me to wear seven Agbadas. We were in the very first auditorium. He knows I don't like Agbada. I only wear it once or twice a year when I want to praise him. And then I wear Agbada. But other, other than that, there's nothing wrong with Agbada. It's a very beautiful dress. The true problem with this, with Agbada, is that it is incorrigible. You swear, you, you swing it this way. Before you finish swinging this way, the other one is already coming down. I say, oh God, whoever created Agbada should have his name in the Guinness Book of Record because he created a dress that has his own mind. He knew I don't like wearing it, but he asked me to wear seven. Even if you like Agbada, you don't want to wear two. 
and they asked me to wear seven. If I don't know his voice, I would have said, get thee behind me, Satan. And then he asked me to dance in that seven for a while. And he's the one speaking, so I did what he asked me to do. And then he asked me to lay the Agba down the altar. And said, anybody who has a problem, tell them to go and touch the Agbada. Touch, not hold. And I told the people, the dress look ordinary. But God has spoken. And people were going there, they were touching and touching. We finished by 8 a.m. And I went to my prayer room to pray and to stay. 5 p.m. They came knocking at the door of my prayer room. What's the problem with two people? They said, somebody's about to die. Uh, so what, what happened? He said his own problem is more than touching. So he grabbed the dress. The dress looked ordinary, but because it had been worn in obedience, it had become saturated with power. I had to beg God to release him. Then I was traveling to America, and God asked me to take one of the Agbada with me. I got there, I explained to the, my children there for during their convention, and there was a white man there. So when I said everybody should be coming to touch, he said, uh, what kind of nonsense is that? Touch a dress. But something told him, go now. After all, they are not asking you to pay for it. And he came and he touched. And he came, his back was in a cage of iron. He had to wear a cage of iron to be able to stand upright. He touched the thing and the iron broke to pieces. I'm talking to you about a God who cannot see. But his power can do anything. Hey, that wall called unbelief will disappear from your life tonight. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And if it's not pleased, then you have a barrier. Maybe I should just mention one more word, and then we'll begin to round up. This other word is a twin sister of unbelief. It is called doubt. Mm, well, they say God can do all things, but how am I sure he will do my own? Why are you doubting? Huh? Mark 11 verse 23, Mark 11 verse 23 says, If you believe and you doubt not, If a man believes and doubt not, he will say to mountains, move. Many a times we have asked mountains to move and we, after we said it, we begin to doubt. And the Bible tells us in James chapter 1 from verse 5 to 8, James chapter 1 from verse 5 to 8, Thank you, Lord. Can you please stand on your feet? And you're going to do something 
only by faith. If you don't believe me, don't, don't do it. Because the Almighty God is asking me to tell, to tell you to shout. And what we are going to shout is, no more limits for me. Thank you, Father. Amen. <laughs> and so shall it be in Jesus' name. Please be seated. In James chapter 1, from verse 5 to 8, I'm, I'm grateful to you, Lord. Thank you. The Bible says if you ask anything in faith, you must not waver. Because it says anyone who is wavering won't get anything from God. Just believe Him. Don't doubt. Now, it is one thing for the world to fall. It's another thing for the world to remain down. I'm closing with that. When the world falls tonight, it must remain down. When the wall of Jericho fell, Joshua cursed anybody who will ever try to build the wall again. Because he wanted the wall to stay down. When David killed Goliath, he didn't just allow him to remain dead, he cut off his head. The elders have a saying, don't play with a snake whose head has not been cut off. The walls that you have made up your mind to destroy, particularly this internal door, internal walls, must remain forever down. No more doubting. No more unbelief. Or the Bible says, hey, some of the things you are believing, some people may say, it is foolishness. Again, we can't believe it. Sir. What if some people don't believe? Will the unbelief of some people make the faith of no effect? The faith of God of no effect? He said, God forbid. Let all men be liars and let God be true. Don't base your faith on the faith of others. Please. I remember very well when God brought me here to this land. I said, son, that's the city I promise you. All we had there was for an Africans. And then we moved on and bought more acres, nine today, ten tomorrow, etc., etc., until we got to about 30 something acres. And I know, <laughs> I know people close to me who discouraged me. 
Some of them are listening to me now. The money we should be spending in building churches is spending it in, in the jungle. We have no money to do this, to do that. He's focusing on the jungle. They are living in that jungle now. Fortunately, I'm not looking in anybody's direction. <laughs> if others don't believe, don't let that affect you. Do I hear amen? If others are doubting, don't let that affect you. If others want to be proud, hey, that's their own concern. Be humble. If the others want to continue in their anger, hey, leave them alone. Maybe they don't know. Let them call you a fool. For being meek. When the wall falls, it must remain forever down, never to rise again. The last wall that I want to mention is sin. Isaiah 59 from verses 1, and 1 to 2. Isaiah 59 from verses, I mean verses 1 and 2. He said, The hand of the Lord is not shortened that he cannot see. Neither is there a heavy that he cannot hear. It's your sin that is a problem. God knows the foundation of every wall. Come pull them down. Just one shout from his children and the wall of Jericho came tumbling down. Some very important people in the time of, year of uh, Paul and Silas put them in prison. They thought that their, their destinies about to be truncated. They thought they would, they, they would finish them the following morning by midnight. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. And the one who knows the foundation of every prison shook it and the doors were flung open. And those who threw them in, ah, thank you, Daddy. The Lord asked me to tell somebody, after tonight, those who said, we don't want to see you, we'll be seeking for you. Those who threw Paul and Silas into prison, they came the following day to beg them to go. My God, we humiliate those who are trying to humiliate you. But if you are living in sin, as powerful as he is, you won't be able to contact him. And if we don't contact him, how will your rest see part? It takes the wind of the Holy Spirit to blow a path through the rest sea. It takes the almighty God, the one who said the earth is mine, the fullness thereof, 
to uproot the wall of Jericho. It took the almighty rock of ages to knock down Goliath. You can't get all these walls down without his help. So if you are here and you have not yet surrendered your life to him, if you are here and you have not made contact with him, I will give you two minutes to rush forward to the altar and come and cry unto him for the salvation of your soul. And if you are backsliding, if you have already gone back to what you want, you say you will never do before, rush forward, come and reconcile with him, and then all walls in your life must come down. So I'm going to count from verse one to I mean from one to ten. I know some of you are very far away, so you need to begin to run even as I begin to count. One. Two. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Almighty God, I want to say thank you very much for your word tonight. Thank you for these people who have decided to respond to the altar call. They have come to you, Lord. You promised that whosoever will come unto you, you will know why cast out. They've come now. Please receive them in Jesus' name. Let your blood wipe away all their sins, Lord. Please save their souls. Write their names in the book of life. Receive them into the family of God. And from now on, any time they cry unto you, please answer them by fire. Thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now I want to rejoice with those of you who have come forward. The counselors will be asking you to fill certain things in a card that they will give to you your names, your address, your prayer requests, so that I can be praying for you from now on. Very soon you'll be receiving miracles you have not even asked for. Then you will know somebody is somewhere praying for you. God bless you. Congratulations. We will wait a little bit for you while the, the choir will be ministering to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah, Jesus. In Jesus. Mighty name we have prayed. In the name that's above every other name. Beginning from now. You will cease to be your own enemies. Everything that is contrary to the will of God. Laziness, anger, unbelief, doubt, pride, I decree they be uprooted tonight. Every wall that you have raised up against your own destiny, 
I decree they come down now. I decree that they will never rise again. I join my faith with yours. And I decree every Red Sea slowing you down, delaying you, allowing your enemies to catch up with you. I decree Red Sea part. Every wall of Jericho that we are so close and yet so far, like the lame man before the beautiful gate, always seeing people rejoicing, dancing, wanting to be partaker. And yet, tie down every such situation in your life. I join my faith with yours. Wall of Jericho, come down. Every Goliath, every force, known and unknown, trying to steal your destiny, I decree, die tonight. Every king saw, every superior officer who had failed, and they want to discourage you from going forward to claim your crown. Even every relative, every alien, whoever they may be that will not allow you reach your goal I decree tonight fall down and die My Father, my God, I'm joining my hands spiritually with all your children in one accord. Where our faith has been weak, from now on, let it be strong. <laughs> Father, you know all things. You know the areas where our joy has been tampered with because our faith is not enough. Oh, please, Daddy. 
Please, Daddy. My Father and my God. Please, tonight, help our own belief. From now on, in the lives of all your children, connected to me one way or the other, please, let the impossible become possible. And help us to be holy. Yeah. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for answered prayers. Father, we believe that it is done. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. We may go back to our seats. Thank you, Jesus. We have one or two things we want to do. Jesus, <laughs> Lord, First, we will thank God as we normally would do. But tonight has been a very, very special night. Even the Thanksgiving is not going to be the end of the service. And we will thank God first. And then, because the Word of God says, if two of you shall agree as touching anything you ask on earth, it will be done for you by our Father in heaven. And I believe that. The senior pastors who had prayed with me before we came, we then come round and lay hands on anyone who believes he or she needs deliverance. You know why they are doing that? If you don't believe that you need deliverance, you are free to go. We would have done Thanksgiving. And of course, the workers know that you have another meeting by 2 a.m. So after the deliverance service, if you want deliverance, you, you come, the pastors will lay hands on you and agree with you. If you're a worker and you don't need deliverance, you may want to go and ease yourself and quickly return and settle down for your two o'clock meeting. In the meantime, the Thanksgiving of tonight will be done with so much joy. The joy of liberty. When the Almighty God set that man by the beautiful gate free, 
The Bible tells us it wasn't just walking. It was walking and leaping and praising God. Tonight you will, you will show your faith to God by dancing the Davis dance. You dance with all your might. You jump, you rejoice, you shake hands with your neighbors. Show the Almighty God that you are glad that you believe that your ways are open now. So very quickly, let's take a thanksgiving offering. And as the band will minister, you go to the nearest uh, basket to you. And then I will bless you. And then we'll go on to the deliverance service.